Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Conversations That Count. I am Sri Lekha Pali, Vice Chair of Community Strategy and Engagement for Fairfax GOP and 11th Congressional District. As part of community engagement, I have been inviting community influencers, candidates, subject matter experts on conversations that count so they can shed light on most important topics that matter to all of us and the communities that we live in. This week, I have invited Hans von Spakowski. Hans is an authority on a wide range of issues, including civil rights, civil justice, the First Amendment, immigration. As manager of think tanks, election law reform initiatives, Hans also studies and writes about campaign finance restrictions, voter fraud, voter ID, enforcement of federal voting rights laws, administration of elections and voting equipment standards. Hans is nation's top election law expert, our broken elections author and heritage senior legal fellow. I can go on and on about Hans, but we'll kind of get right to the topic. He is the topmost expert in the country. So I'm very grateful and thankful that he took the time to come on to our show. Again, as I said, I'm personally grateful that he's agreed to be on Conversations That Count. As soon as our audience came to know Hans is going to be on our show, the folks had tons of questions questions. So, so we're going to get right into that uh, topic, Hans. Most of the questions are pertaining to election integrity. But as okay. an immigrant, I do have a couple of questions about immigration that I'll get to as well. Thank you for joining us on Conversations That Count. Sure. Well, no, I'm happy to be here. And as you probably know, uh, I'm first generation American. So I understand immigration issues also. Thank you. So Hans, in an era of razor thin election margins, protecting the integrity of campaigns and elections are vital to the preservation of our republic form of government and the rule of law. What do you think is going on in this in state and federal elections these days? Just say, let's say in 2022, what is going on? Well, there's, you know, there, there have been two tracks on this, the federal track and the state track. Now, fortunately on the federal track, um, several really bad bills that were introduced by um, uh, Speaker Nancy Pelosi were stopped. Um, one of them, HR1, uh, was an 800-page monstrosity that would have uh, taken over the administration election from the states and uh, prohibited things like voter ID. HR1 said no state could have a voter ID law, if you can believe it and also put in all kinds of other bad mandates, things that would have, uh, frankly, damaged the integrity and security of the election process. It passed the House, but it got filibustered successfully in the U.S. Senate. So, you know, Mitch McConnell led that effort, not a single uh, Republican defected from that. So fortunately, that got stopped uh, before it be could become law and, and certainly before the upcoming elections. Um, on the state side, and, and everyone should keep in mind, look, we've got the most decentralized election system of any Western democracy. You know, there's no central government agency that runs our elections. These are run by the states. Um, what that means is that, yeah, there are some states that run their elections very badly, like California and New York, but there are a lot of other states that are doing a fairly good job. And What's happened in the last two years, ever since the 2020 election, is that many state legislators and, frankly, members of the public finally realized something I've been talking about for many years, which is pointing out the holes in our system. And so over the past two years, a lot of state legislators have acted. They've passed actually good reform bills. Uh, Georgia did, Texas did, Florida did, a number of other states also, probably about a dozen and a half states, um, passed reforms that have actually improved the fairness and honesty of their election. Now, most of them are in court fighting uh, lawsuits filed by the very partisan Merrick Garland, uh, Joe Biden Justice Department, but so far, they've pretty much been successful in uh, defending those, those uh, new laws. Yeah, Hans, your expertise is very much uh, valuable for us. So let's talk about Sarah Pell Pellin's elections. I mean, that was right. a 
surprised to me. I woke up, I'm like, what happened? What happened, right? So she loses the special election, becoming the first, I mean, Democrat becoming the first native Alaskan in Congress. She practically snatched that election house seat from Republican. Um, so my question to you is, what can you tell about ranked voting in Alaska? Before I started this call, I spoke to one of our community members from Fairfax GOP. And the community member had this question saying that, um, if I really like a candidate and I don't know anything else about other candidate, what can I do? How can I cheat the system in such a way that um, uh, my vote after voting for the first candidate and if that candidate does not go into the second uh, round right. after the ranked choice, I don't want my can my vote to go to the second candidate. What can I do to cheat the system? So what can you tell us about ranked voting that happened in Alaska? Any learning lessons that we need to keep right. in the back of our minds for the future right, right here in Virginia? What can you tell us about it? Well, the lesson to learn from Alaska and its uh, ap application of ranked choice voting is it's a bad system and we should do everything we can to prevent this from going into effect in Virginia. Now, for folks who don't know what this is, ranked choice voting is this system where when you go into the voting booth, instead of voting for your, your candidate, the one you want to have win, you are supposed to vote for all of the candidates running for that office by ranking them. So, for example, if you're, if you're voting for a city council seat and there are four candidates in the race, you're supposed to rank them. What's your first choice, your second choice, your third choice, and your fourth choice. If no candidate wins a majority, then what happens is they take whichever candidate got the least amount of votes. They throw out all of his first, uh, all of the, the, the votes that had him as their first choice. And then they take the second choice of those voters. And suddenly those second choices become first choice and they do another round of tabulation. What happened in Alaska is, first of all, ranked choice voting was approved by a referendum back in 2020 uh, by 50.5%. So it barely passed. And a lot of people had no idea what they were voting in. Um, in an ordinary system, Sarah Palin would have won that election. But what happened was, uh, you had three candidates. You had Sarah Palin, uh, you had uh, uh, Mary uh, 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 Patolta, sorry, uh, the Democrat, but there was a third candidate in the race who was a Republican. So voters split their votes between the two Republicans. Um, the top two vote getters, the Democrat and Sarah Palin, didn't make it over 50%. So what did they do? They went to a second round of voting. And many of the uh, voters who had voted for the other Republican candidate, about 11,000 of them, hadn't put down any second choice. So their votes were thrown out. <laughs> they weren't counted. And that is the big problem with ranked choice voting. Most people aren't going to rank all of the candidates. And so if they go into a second round, a third round, a fourth round of voting, if you didn't rank all the candidates, your vote potentially is going to get discarded. And to, to give you an example of how bad this can be, um, you know, the recent New York mayor's race in which Eric Adams was elected? For the first time ever, New York City used ranked choice voting. There were 10 candidates in the race. The vast majority of people didn't rank all 10 of the candidates. They went through eight rounds, if you can believe that, eight rounds of tabulating votes. And by the time they got to the eighth round, they had thrown out the ballots of over 141,000 voters who hadn't uh, ranked all of the candidates. So rank choice voting is just a really bad system. Um, it's being pushed by the progressive left. Uh, the big foundations that fund the left, like uh, uh, George Soros's foundation, the, the Tides Foundation, et cetera, they're the ones who are pouring money into make, getting this change made. And most people have no idea what it is they're voting for when they approve it. Absolutely. Hopefully, Virginia will learn the lessons and we won't go through that. I, I hope so. 
Uh -huh. So Hans, you co-authored a book. Uh, I mean, you you obviously wrote multiple books. Who's counting? I'm in the midst of reading our broken elections. You right. had this Obama's enforcer. For those that few that haven't read these books, what should be their take-home messages? One of the reasons I ask is that all the things that you were saying in the past, I think the one thing that good came out of 2020, all the things that you were saying in the past were considered, you were considered to be a pundit, right? But then <laughs> after 2020, you were considered you start you people started calling you at least the progressive left started calling you conspiracy theorists the minute they start calling you conspiracy theorists you know you are right <laughs> you're absolutely right so I, I think that is one good thing that came out of 2020 elections but what right. what should be people's take home messages for folks that haven't read the book uh, your books what, what do you well, like the, the first is that voter fraud unlike what the left will tell you is actually real in this country it does happen now is it massive no, I don't think that, but it happens often enough that we need to take steps to try to deter it. And where can it really make a difference? In close elections, obviously. And, you know, the, the books that John Fund and I have written, I mean, we, we illustrate, as you know, case after case of proven fraud. Now, does the fraud always affect elections? No. I mean, sometimes it's an isolated individual, like uh, two cases I just saw where um, folks forged the signatures and filled out absentee ballots for their deceased mothers and submitted them. But on the other hand, uh, sometimes there are conspiracies to steal elections. That also just recently happened. Uh, happened a judge in Compton, California, just overturned a city council race there. Uh, five people were convicted of engaging in fraud, which consisted of fraudulent absentee ballots by individuals who registered to vote in Compton, even though they don't live there. The city council member who got elected and who was also convicted of fraud in his own election, won his election by one vote. So that demonstrate that in closed elections, it doesn't take a lot. So fraud occurs. There are many things that states can do to deter and minimize it they just gotta. They just gotta get it done. You know, a basic a basic step in that direction is passing a voter ID law. I mean, why in the world would anybody think that it's okay not to require people to present an ID when they go do something that is as valuable as voting? And yet, in New York and California, two of the biggest states in the country, there's no ID requirement, which makes fraud very easy to commit there. So. People shouldn't feel helpless about this. Um, a lot of these holes have actually been fixed in places, uh, particularly red states. It, they can be, the, the system can be improved. It can be remedied. You can make it much harder to uh, uh, commit fraud and you can do it easily without preventing anyone who's eligible from voting. Hans, I'm a Fairfax County mom this afternoon too. I went to volunteer at my daughter's school and I had to show ID twice before I could even get into yeah. PTA office, <laughs> two doors. <laughs> so right. it just is uh, beyond me that, uh, and right. uh, I was a PTA president. So they see me in and out of school all the time. I still had to present my ID, get the barcode in, <laughs> put the barcode in and get, um, get inside. It just is beyond me of what is so racist about just showing your ID and getting to work. Yeah, but listen, the same liberal members of the Board of Education who make you show that ID to get into your children's school are probably out there saying, oh my gosh, it, uh, uh, requiring people to show an ID to vote, why that's discriminatory and we shouldn't be doing that. I mean, there's a dichotomy there that makes no sense. Fortunately, the American people recognize that. You know, uh, polling consistently shows that Americans overwhelmingly say, well, of course you should show an ID to vote. And frankly, that's a nonpartisan issue. A majority of Republicans, a majority of Democrats, a majority of uh, white, black, Hispanic Americans all say ID. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. And also, Hans, I think I've, I've, uh, as a mom, I've seen this often. Every single time you have to buzz in to get into school and if anybody sighs, like, huh, I have to do this. There's always somebody behind saying that, but it's for safety. 
So you right. always have somebody commenting that. So, uh, so I, as you said, majority of Americans have common sense. They understand that it yeah. is the, for the safety of our own children. So I, I, I think it's, uh, I, I don't get it. I just don't know which small percentage are the ones that are pushing for not having all of those. Sure. So Hans, with the midterms coming in, 2022 midterms are rapidly approaching. Right. Uh, can Americans be confident that our right to vote is properly protected? Because for the past uh, two years, Hans, I'm sure, um, there are a lot of people out there that are working for election integrity. You can agree that in Fairfax County, we've really been pushing. You know, Chris, yeah. uh, Brim, we have champions, Andy Bear, we have Barbara. I mean, we have th these three champions. And I'm sure there are thousands of volunteers within uh, Fairfax County, along with these three leaders and champions that are working tirelessly hard. Um, so uh, do you think we can be confident now that our vote is properly protected? Um, again, it depends on what state you're in. Okay. You know, um, there are many states, mostly red states, where, yeah, I think you can trust um, the result as long as people are, from the grassroots, are participating. I mean, look, what you just said is absolutely true. A crucial thing in our state elections last year was the fact that we had more citizens participating as poll watchers and also working in the polls than I think we've ever had. There was a real effort made to do that. That's very, very important. Can you have that same kind of confidence in California? No, California has no ID requirement. They issue driver's licenses to people who aren't US citizens, and they're not very careful at all in trying to uh, uh, maintain the security of the election process. In fact, they're very dismissive of any efforts to do that. So yeah, I would worry if I was in California, um, if I'm living in uh, Georgia, if I'm living in Texas, if I'm, if I'm living in Virginia, I'm not gonna be that concerned about it as long as people are in the polls working and observing on election day, because transparency is very important to this. So Hans, in one of the video that I watched, as I said, I do watch a lot of your videos. You are, uh, you are out there like a champion talking about this and uh, we learn a lot from what you're saying. Talk to us about election integrity scorecard. Where do we go find out about oh, scorecard? Sure. How, how do we uh, actually go out to city commissioner and question them based on the scorecard? Yeah. Um... In January of 2021, so just a couple of months after the 2020 election, uh, our legal center at Heritage, we realized that, uh, you know, while I off the top of my head knew some states were bad, like California and New York and other states were better, um, there was no objective measure of all 50 states. So we started a year-long project in which we analyzed the laws of all 50 states and the District of Columbia, since even though it's not a state, they have three electoral college votes for the presidential election. And we compared their election laws to a set of best practices that we had developed for everything from uh, saying that a state ought to have a voter ID law to standards for how they should maintain uh, and clean up their voter rolls to make sure they don't have people who are dead on the rolls, et cetera. Anyway, um, we then rated every single state. And um, that is available on the uh, Heritage website. Just go to heritage.org um, and click on the issue election integrity and it'll pull it right up. And what you can do with that is you can click on any state It'll bring that state up. It'll tell, tell you what its grade was. We A perfect score was 100. No state in the country got 100. Um, and uh, we list all of the 47 different criteria we use to judge the state. So you can see what your state is missing. You know, If, for example, you got a zero on voter ID, that means your state doesn't require an ID to vote. So anyone, you can pull this up. And it gives citizens and frankly, state legislators the ability to go through and see, well, what's my state missing? You know, what is it we need to do that we're not doing now to improve the honesty of our election? That, that's very good to know, Hans. I have one of the audience also asking about, um, what about the overt left winger who is the chief election officer in Falls Church? I'm not sure if you know the gentleman at all. 
uh, just, uh, um, just kind of wondering who the chief election officer in Falls Church is. If he's no, I don't. I sorry, I don't. I don't know the answer to that. I, you know, I, I don't live in Falls Church. I live out in Fairfax County, so uh, okay. I, I, I don't know a lot about the Falls Church elections. I know they have their own. They run their elections themselves. I, I believe you know, the county doesn't do it, but I don't have a lot of information about that. Um, uh, I, again, also another thing that uh, has, uh, came up is um, uh, our uh, Attorney General Miyaris new right. election integrity ta task force. He announced right. actually as of today, and uh, also one of our um, uh, our uh, viewer was asking if you know of that integrity task force and if you know of their agenda and so on and so forth. Uh, well, I don't. I don't know about their agenda, but I mean, the announcement from the attorney general's office says that the whole point of this election integrity unit is to investigate possible election crimes and prosecute them. Um, this is because uh, up until a couple of years ago, only local DAs, you know, the Commonwealth attorney in each county in Virginia could investigate and prosecute election crimes. The state legislature changed the law to give the state attorney general the ability to prosecute uh, election crimes and election fraud. That is a good thing because one of the biggest problems we have in this area, and frankly, including in Virginia, is local county DAs just ignoring these cases even when they come up and not pursuing them. I, I have personal experience with that. 10 years ago, I was actually on the Fairfax County Electoral Board um, we discovered almost 300 people who were not U.S. citizens who were registered to vote in Fairfax County. They had gotten registered when they went to get their driver's license. About half of them had actually voted in prior elections. We took them off the rolls, but we then sent it to the local DA in Fairfax County because it's obviously a felony for an alien to register and vote. And uh, would you care to guess what the uh, Commonwealth's attorney in Fairfax County did about those 300 cases? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And also, I'm sure you're uh, kind of getting familiar with Susan Beals. She's the new commissioner. She got appointed by Governor Youngkin. She is also, she obviously inherited a lot of uh, new problems, and she is asking, uh, uh, folks to copy materials from 2020 to 2021, and our Fairfax County unanimously passed a, re a resolution to allow photographing of 2021 to 2020 to 2021 materials, uh, uh, just so they have the statement of results, the paper tapes, and presumably all other election materials except for ballots and so on and so forth. So a lot of uh, new initiatives that are going on, so hopefully that will kind of tighten the process of uh, right and increase the integrity of election. Um, uh, but Hans, I also wanted to kind of get your opinion on 2000 Mules. Uh, I'm sure you kind of saw the movie. What do you think of that? What does that tell about election security? Well, what, what uh, Dinesh D'Souza did is um, he raised a lot of questions about the 2020 election. You know, he raised a lot of questions about what were all these individuals doing, dropping off, multiple uh, absentee ballots repeatedly at different drop boxes in states like Arizona and, and Georgia. Uh, but he went only as far as a filmmaker can go. What should have happened and what I don't think has happened is um, law enforcement should have taken the information in 2000 mules and used it to identify these individuals who were dropping off these absentee ballots and they should have started an investigation and pulled them in and interrogated them, ask, asking them questions like, where did you get these absentee ballots? Were these legitimate ballots? The kind of questions that would enable you to figure out whether they were acting you know, legitimately or whether they were acting illegally, stealing ballots from voters, et cetera. That hasn't been done, uh, and so I don't think those questions are ever going to get answered. But by, by the way, I should mention, you know, I'm actually in 2000 Mules. Um, I, I'm I'm one of the individuals that uh, Dinesh D'Souza actually interviews to explain how absentee ballot fraud uh, is committed, all the various ways it's been done uh, in prior elections. 
Is that so? I mean, that is news to me. So are you actually in the movie? Yeah, I'm in the movie. That is so cool. I should pay attention next time. And <laughs> that's, that's very good to know. So Hans, this is not relation, uh, related to election integrity. Again, as I said, as in uh, coming from immigration background, I always would like to kind of explore that uh, immigration questions. Right. I mean, coming to DACA reform um, uh, with Biden administration, where do you think we are? I mean, is Biden trying to explore this DACA again? Is there a reform going on there? What is the update on that? Uh, yeah, he they once they've put out new rules, um, proposed new rules for DACA in which they're trying to basically re-implement the program. The problem with that is that um, no president has the authority to put in a general amnesty program for people who are here illegally. Congress can do it. I mean, Congress has full authority over immigration issues, as you well know. And if they wanted to put in an amnesty program, they could do it. But a president doesn't have the power to do that. And it's not, not just me saying it, but that's what the courts said previously when Barack Obama first put this program in place, that, that a president doesn't have the authority to basically override federal immigration law and do it. So, uh, you know, these new rules that he's trying to put in to extend DACA, I don't think are constitutional. Will Congress ever act on this issue? I don't know. I mean, you know, the, the Democratic and Republican parties are at loggerheads on this. And the idea that any kind of legislation will come through, I think, is, is pretty slim. Okay. So what do you think, what is your idea on fixing the demand versus su the supply for growing skilled and non-skilled workers, right? We have these I'm, skilled I'm, workers. How do you, uh, how do you fix uh, the demand and supply for, uh, I mean, there for, is- for, I'm thing. sorry, the demand and supply for what? For, I mean, we have this growing skilled workers and there is growing unskilled workers needed in the United States. So how do you fix this demand versus supply? Well, our immigration system does not get fixed. How do you fix this growing skilled and unskilled workers demand? Well, part of what needs to happen is, um, look, our laws of, against illegal immigration need to be enforced, but our legal immigration system needs to be reformed. Um, you may recall that during the Trump administration, uh, the Trump administration, uh, the, the Trump White House proposed uh, reforming our system to come up with the kind of point system that countries like Germany, Australia, and others have put in, where they consider uh, legal immigrants, people who want to come to this country, um, based on everything from their educational, vocational, professional background to other factors so that we have more, uh, uh, so that we are making better decisions on who we allow to immigrate into this country. And I think looking at that kind of system, which many other countries have adopted, is what ought to be done. And, and one of the things you would take into account in a system like that is, you know, where in the United States do you not have the workers you need for particular uh, industries uh, and professions and that would be something you could take into account, which right now, that's just not really part of the system. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Even 20 years back when I came in, I'm a physical therapist by background. So there was a, a very specific classification of why they were giving me visa. They needed mm -hmm. physical therapists. So there was uh, that extreme demand of why they would uh, fast track me but they wouldn't right. fast track now. So I think you're absolutely right. I mean, look and see where the need is and fast track them, but don't fast track everyone every single time or vice versa. Right. Right. So and by the way, I mean, something people should consider, look, all the folks that are saying, oh, we should just give amnesty to the upwards of 12 million aliens who are in the country illegally, that would really hurt legal immigrants because the Department of Homeland Security already lacks the resources to quickly process the applications of legal immigrants. If all of a sudden they have to start processing the applications of 12 million illegal aliens, it would slow the process for uh, people who actually follow the rules to come here like you. It would delay it I mean, I can't even imagine how long it would delay it. So that kind of program would actually hurt legal immigrants. 
Absolutely. Hans, that's one thing that uh, I tell the legal immigrants all the time. I said, I always understand the empathy aspect, but you also need to understand about legal. I mean, how fair is it to the legal immigrants that follow right. through the entire paperwork process and so on and so forth. Uh, Hans, I, when you, so you spoke at Fairfax GOP, one thing that I was impressed when you said is you started as a precinct captain, you started at polling places as a poll watcher. So how do we get youth engaged? I mean, that's one thing that I'm very, I'm very passionate about. How do I get minorities engaged? How do I integrate them to mainstream America? How do I get them engaged in policies and politics? Uh, so the same thing, how do we get youth engaged into politics? Or how do you get them engaged into uh, election process? What, what was your motivating factor to get engaged into all of this? See, that's, well, that is a tough problem for which there is not an easy answer. And, you know, it's like so many things in this country, it goes back to family structure. You know, um, I, I, got, I got interested in this area because I came from immigrant parents both of whom had experienced dictatorships. And I was taught, I mean, I was born here, but I was taught growing up how lucky we were to be in this country and how valuable the ability to actually vote was. And my parents used to, all, even when I was a kid, would take me with them to go to the, to the voting booth. And it's that kind of, I think it's that kind of family education. Now, hopefully you can supplement that too with better civics education because like so many things in our educational field now um you know woke woke culture is more concerned with uh feeding um critical race theory propaganda into people's into kids minds than giving them a proper civics education and teaching them the importance of voting and participating in the political process um so I think it's a mixture of all of that. Uh, and is it an easy issue to solve? No, it's not. So what about uh, minorities and stuff? I mean, uh, does Heritage have any specific education for youth, minorities, uh, to see how we can better integrate them into mainstream politics? Does Heritage do any kind of work in that aspect? Well, I think that's just a matter. I, I think that's that's a matter of, for example, conservatives actually going into conservative into uh, minority communities and speaking and engaging. Something that unfortunately they often just don't do because they just assume they're not going to get anywhere. But in fact, all you have to do is look at the changing vote patterns. I think in the last presidential election, for example, Hispanics in Texas split their vote 50-50 between. Uh, the Democrats and the Republicans, which is which is quite a change. And I think a lot of that is uh, simply, like I said, taking the time to try to reach them and and talk to them. You know, on social issues, for example, uh, a lot of members of the black community are far more conservative <laughs> than the general public it is something that I learned many, many years ago when I actually uh, I don't know if you know this, but back when I lived in Atlanta more than 20 years ago for two years, I was actually the chairman of the Fulton County Republican Party down there. And okay. um, I, I actually made a special effort to, for example, uh, go talk to the Hispanic uh, business chamber. Apparently, they'd never had a Republican come talk to them. I, I made a special effort to go down into some of the predominantly African-American high schools there to talk to the kids. They, they were uh, often astounded when I told them the things that conservatives believe in, because it was the kind of things they heard in their families, but they just assumed that uh, they should always vote de uh, Democratic. Absolutely. I think that's one thing as uh, Fairfax GOP and 11th Congressional District hands, we have been trying to kind of get out there, talk about our candidates, our values. We're trying to get on like Korean videos, uh, I'm sorry, Korean radios, news outlets. Right. Uh, South Asian radios and so on and so forth, and just kind of interview our candidates and talk about the values and so on and so forth. So uh, as we are coming to the end of the show, Hans, I, uh, we, we have so much more to talk about, but I do have like last couple of questions. Okay. Uh, what do you think of the student debt forgiveness and Biden inflation? Uh, the president did not have the, this is another, this is another instance 
of uh, Biden acting as if he uh, has no limits on his power in the Constitution. Under the statutes that set up the student loan program, he has no authority to simply say, you don't have to pay these back. And I, I, that is so unfair. Um, it's unfair to, the, to, to the, all of the students who, when they got out and started working, paid back their student loan. And it is unfair to all the folks, for example, uh, in, in vocations, people in vocational uh, uh, type of, types of professions who their tax money is being used to pay off the student debts of students um, uh, uh, in a way that I think is just fundamentally un unfair. And as you know, many economists have already pointed out that this is inflationary and is going to uh, uh, cause problems for the economy. Plus, you know, schools all over this country, universities, their tuition prices have been going up at astronomical rates, far more than the rate of inflation. And one of the reasons for that is because, you know, their attitude is, well, uh, these students can borrow the money. So we don't need to, we don't need to conserve. You know, we don't need to watch our spending and this will just make that problem even worse. Absolutely, absolutely. I said, if you can't afford, then you probably should be, get, should not, if you can't afford that kind of degree, then right. probably you should consider not getting that degree, uh, earn some money and then kind of pay out later on. <laughs> uh, so Hans, um, as you know, believe it or not, I mean, early voting is starting next week. I think it is next Saturday. Um, I mean, gone are those days when election day is a day or two. It is now weeks and weeks and weeks, right? And then the election results wouldn't even come in uh, for days after that, which is kind of strange because it's supposed to be it a is. day or two. So any words of wisdom for our hardworking poll watching teams, election integrity teams, volunteers, election officers? This is like a season now. Right. So uh, we, are, we have been preparing for months with these absentee ballots. I mean, uh, trying to kind of get volunteers to sign up, hundreds and hundreds of volunteers. A lot of training going into effect. Um, uh, so any words of wisdom for them? Any words of motivation for them? Well, I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, kudos to the people who are signing up for this. Um, I think the way we've extended voting from election day to a month, two months before election is, is not good policy. And one of the reasons it's not good, there are many reasons it's not good, but one of the reasons it's not good is that uh, transparency, like I said, is fundamental to honest elections. The ability of all the political parties and the candidates to have poll watchers observing every aspect of the election. That's almost impossible to do when you extend out uh, election day for a month and a half before the election. And I, like I said, I, I have great admiration for the people who are volunteering to do this. And what I would say to them is, this is very important. If you're lucky, your days of, of, as observers will be really boring. That's good because that means nothing happens. You know, nothing illegal happens. Nothing happens that shouldn't be happening. Uh, but it's really important that you be there. And I'll give you just one example of that. Folks may remember back in 2008, when Barack Obama was running for president uh, against John McCain, remember, uh, it turned out that there were um, members of the uh, new Black Panther Party dressed up in paramilitary uniforms with nightsticks standing outside of a Philadelphia polling place yelling racial epithets at and trying to intimidate white voters and white poll watchers going in. The only reason we know about this is because there happened to be a poll watcher there, a young college student who had volunteered and who took a video of this on his camera election officials in Philadelphia weren't doing anything about it. But it was because that he was there that this was seen, it was noticed, and it was finally stopped. And it's only because that poll watcher was there. That shows you just how important this whole process is and how important it is for people to participate. And Hans, I mean, another reason why college kids should be involved, right? I yes, mean, exactly right. 
they have the technology, the knowledge, the agility to take right. their cell phones and start recording things around and stuff. So Hans, where do you see yourself uh, doing this work in the next five years? I mean, wh what do you see yourself doing this? I mean, is there going to be like blockchain technology? I mean, are we going to be doing voting via electronic internet? You think uh, Mark Zuckerberg will continue to exert pressure on us? I mean, wh where do you see this entire field going in the next five years? Well, I, a lot of folks have been pushing for internet voting, which is a really bad idea, very dangerous. That is not going to happen if people are smart because you talk to computer scientists and all of them are actually against internet voting because they talk about how insecure the entire internet system is. So I don't think that's gonna happen. Also, as you know, there's been quite a, a reaction to the use of electronic voting machine. You know, 20 years ago after the Bush-Gore debacle in Florida, everybody was saying, oh, we, we need to move to all electronic voting machines, that'll solve all these problems. Uh, and, and now people are rejecting those because they don't trust them either. So I think in some ways we may be going um, backwards, probably in a good way, back to, for example, paper ballots um, that, yeah, they're counted with computer scanners, which is a good thing because then you have the speed of counting, but you have an audit trail. You know, if there's any claims about the software in the scanners and the tabulators, you have the paper ballots, which can be hand counted. So I don't think the technology is going to change. What hopefully will change is states will start doing a much better job of, for example, cleaning up their voter lists and using modern technology to do that, using existing databases, for example, that the government has, that commercial companies like credit agencies have to make sure that the person they have registered in their county really lives there, hasn't died, hasn't moved out of state, and is a U.S. citizen. Absolutely, absolutely. Hans, thank you so much. I think sure. the thing that really keeps me up in the night is these absentee ballots too. Yes. So the, work, the work that you are doing really, really assures us that our vote is, uh, is going to count. So the election scorecard, the election fraud database, all of the times that you're on news, keeping us focused as well. And we appreciate you and your expertise very much. And we also thank Heritage Foundation. I know Heritage Foundation does such great work out there. We've had guests in the past and we are very thankful for the work that you do and what Heritage Foundation does. Thank you well, for joining us on sure. Conversations That Count. Well, thanks for having me on. And uh, I, I'm happy to be back. If you want to talk about other issues? Yeah, yes, the, the, this is good for now, and we will continue to keep inviting you on our show in the right. in the future as well. I want to be very sensitive to your time. I appreciate you very much. Thank you. All right. Good night. Good night. Viewers, hope you learned and enjoyed hearing Hans as much as I did. As, as you know, he's an expert in election integrity and other issues as well. Next Friday, we will have Lisa Gable. She's the former U.S. ambassador and author. She'll be on Conversation That Count to discuss mentoring the next generation of political leaders at every level. I hope you keep watching Conversations That Count. Continue to comment and continue to write us and tell us what other guests you would like to listen from, and we will continue to keep inviting them. Thank you. Um, have a wonderful rest of the weekend. Uh, God bless you all and God bless America. Thank you.